Here. Excuse me. Here. Mr. Hassan? Here. Mr. Murphy? Here. Ms. Shelton? Here. Uh, here, one item before we get started. Uh, we uh, have the pleasure of being the first in the city to use a new uh, voting system, uh, an electronic system that's designed to uh, increase transparency, uh, allow for easy access to, uh, to city records, and to allow you all and folks who may be uh, viewing this uh, from outside uh, to clearly understand the voting and uh, the processes behind what we're doing. So this being the first uh, attempt at this, bear with us. We have some other folks around to help us uh, with some of the technology. Uh, so we're going to do our best, uh, best job today with this new technology, and I'm glad you all could be part of it. With that, we'll move forward. Item number one, uh, one from the continued so, agenda. Uh, the first item on your agenda um, is a request by Metzone for a conditional use permit to operate a nightclub at 846 East Little Creek Road. Uh, commissioners, the applicant has requested that this application be withdrawn. Um, Susan, can you Susan. get your microphone to work? Thank you. Thank Better? You. Better. Okay. Um, so the applicant has requested that this application be withdrawn. So the motion would be uh, to accept the withdrawal of the application. Any discussion? Are we ready for the vote? All votes have been casted. Any changes? Okay. Uh, the uh, chair, uh, the commission has voted uh, by a vote of six to zero to accept the withdrawal. Okay. Thank you. Regular agenda number item number one. Okay. Uh, item number one is a request by Richard Katz for a change of zoning from IL Industrial Light to Conditional CC uh, Community Commercial at 811 through 815 44th Street. The purpose of this request is to allow for a surface parking for Kogan's Pizza. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, this application is by Richard Katz. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the site. It's Kogan's Pizza or Kogan's P Pizza North, uh, as some folks call it. Um, the site is located on the southwest corner of Collie Avenue and 44th Street. Um, and as we know, Collie Avenue is a very commercial uh, corridor with similar businesses, with residential uh, and industrial and other uses located uh, to the rear uh, of this commercial corridor. Um, the applicant is proposing to demolish three existing single-family homes to construct a parking lot, which will accommodate 22 parking spaces for Kogan. Uh, the site where the houses are and a portion of the site where Kogan's is located is currently zoned IL. So the request would be to rezone these properties to, re to match the remainder of the Kogan site uh, along Collie Avenue, which is uh, CC, uh, Community Commercial. Um, so this is the site plan, and just to let you know, this actually has been through the formal site plan review process. Um, the site is also located in, in what we call a coastal resiliency overlay, meaning that they've got to do some things to accommodate stormwater. So one of the things they're required to do is to make the actual parking spaces pervious. So you notice the pavers uh, are pervious. So they meet the requirements of all of the requirements of the new zoning ordinance. The CRO or the CRO as we call it, as well as um, the landscaping requirements. Again, 22 parking spaces would be provided for Kogan's uh, through this parking lot. Um, staff is recommending that this uh, application be approved, um, subject to the following condition. The site shall be generally designed in accordance with the conceptual site plan prepared by WPA uh, L Landscaping Architects dated May 11, 2018, attached hereto and marked as Exhibit A, including landscaping, pervious pavers, and a sidewalk abutting the site. And again, that's the site plan that we're looking at here. Um, so, any questions that I can answer? No questions. Uh, here on behalf of this uh, application as uh, the applicant, uh, Richard Katz. Any questions? No, sir. No, uh, also, uh, here, uh, Robin Thomas. Okay. Uh, no, uh, no opposition uh, to this item. Any comments, questions, commissioners? Okay. Murphy. 
All votes have been cast. Any changes? Okay, Mr. Chair, um, by a six to zero vote, unanimous, the, the, the commission uh, has voted to recommend approval of the request. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Katz. We look forward to joining you and the boys over there. Uh, that motion passed. We'll make that recommendation to council. Uh, next item. Okay. Uh, the next item is a request by James Flanagan for a right-of-way closure of a certain piece or parcel of land situate lying and being in the city of Norfolk. Virginia said parcel contains 3,679 square feet or 0 .04 acres, more or less, being a portion of Schumadine Road between 37th Street and 38th Street. Good afternoon, Planning Commission. Uh, this is an application for a right-of-way closure for a portion of Schumadine Road. Schumadine Road is located in the Kensington neighborhood. Um, this segment of Schumadine is between 37th and 38th Street, um, just to the east of Hampton Boulevard. Uh, to the north of this area would be the Highland Park neighborhood. Uh, just to orient yourself, that the purpose of the closure is to consolidate the parcel, parcels on either side for a new development, which we'll hear about in the next item. Um, the road does not serve or is unimproved and serves no transportation purpose, um, and no easements were necessary. There are no utilities in this area, and for those reasons, we would recommend approval. Okay. Um, here on behalf of the uh, application, um, uh, James Flanagan? Yes, sir. Be available for questions? Absolutely. Sounds great. Uh, also, uh, here, Dolores Small. Uh, are you uh, here to speak or have uh, questions? Uh, no. no? Just listen. Okay. Uh, here, uh, as an opponent uh, or against this application, uh, Barrington Gibbs, Gibbs, you'd like to speak? Uh, also uh, against the application, uh, Howard Gordon. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, I'm Howard Gordon. My address is 999 Waterside Drive in Norfolk. Uh, I'm here today in representing uh, the owners of the next, which is the apartment complex directly across 38th Street, uh, as well as in coordination with uh, uh, Don Stansbury over at Old Dominion, Dean of Students, as well as the uh, uh, Old Dominion Real Estate Foundation. Uh, at this point, we really don't know whether we're for or against what's going on. Uh, I left a message earlier from his, uh, <clears throat> from his Pollock that we were going to appear today because I just got involved yesterday or the day before. Mr. Gibbs is the manager of the next apartments, but we'd like an opportunity to meet with the university and review the plan in connection with the Hampton uh, Boulevard plans, the traffic on 38th Street and other items, and we'd ask that the commission defer this matter for 30 days, as well as items B and C that are also part of two, the uh, change of zoning uh, and the, uh, the increased density on that site. Thank you. Um, uh, move back into a uh, rebuttal period, give the applicant an opportunity uh, to speak if, uh, if you'd like. Um, Mr. Flanagan, just give us your name and address for the mailing, uh, mailing address for the record. Sure, it's uh, James Flanagan, 503 East Main Street, Richmond, Virginia, 23219. So, uh, like the proponent said, he's not for or against the project. He doesn't know about it. Uh, we've been working on this project uh, for quite some time and uh, don't really want to delay the project moving forward. We have done a traffic study on uh, the, the project, and at 38th Street, it's saying that it's going to be about a 2% increase in traffic, which is minimal uh, there. Um, I think it's a great project, a great use for the land that's there. It's currently a blighted area, um, so we would like this to uh, continue and not be delayed. Any questions? No. Any questions? No. Um, also, here, Ms. Small, did you want to speak or add anything during this period? Uh, we can ready to put up a five-unit. Come on up to the right? mic podium for me, please. Uh, <coughs> let me stand up. Can I stand 
could stand up. Uh, sure. Yeah. Just bear along with me. Mm -mm. Okay. Thank you. Whatever's most comfortable for you. Okay. I live on 38th Street, and on 38th Street, it's been congested since they put up that ODU uh, building in front of me. Excuse me, everybody. 38th Street is a problem. <laughs> now they're getting ready to put up another building there. It's going to be another problem. And excuse me again. It's going to be another problem with another building coming up. I know that I know it's a new generation coming up. And I'm getting older, so I'm looking forward. And I'm not going to be here forever. I'm looking forward. So as the world as, as the world turns, it's a new generation. So now, when you, when you pay for your home, you look to be comfortable as the years go by. So now, believe me, it's uh, a problem with people moving in. And I mean, it's, it's a problem. People coming knocking at your door late at night, cross the street for Old Dominion College, and people knocking at your door know, one o'clock, two o'clock at night. And I'm I'm looking for that other building coming up. <laughs> and oh, and I'm looking for another problem coming in. Cause I don't pre where, where I'm going at. Where, where, where am I going at? I don't work and pay for my home. And I've been living there. I don't raise my children. So where, 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 do, where, I, where, I, where am I going? Where, huh? Believe me, where do I go? My home is paid for, right? Where did Lord Small supposed to go at? Thank you, Miss Small. Right? <laughs> my, this, this, is, this is my baby. This is my baby. My father owned 64 homes before in, yeah. in Norfolk, Virginia. And you know, this, so his this name is, is Melvin Small. I I own a home in Philadelphia and so I know. So I had to move bad. here to take care of my mother. It's horrible it's bad, here. Yeah. And it's so, sad on 38th Excuse Street. me, Mom. Um, old, old Dominion University, they built the complete <laughs> garage in front of her home. It's horrible. She has people coming at 1, 2, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. So she has to move out her home. This is why I'm here. She has to leave. Oh, and I had to close her. my home up to come here to take care of her. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a um, college, it's a college place now. It's not a multiple single home drilling anymore. It's completely uh, a college um, facility where she can live at now. She has to move out. She's getting people 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Because her address is 1037, the college is 1037. So she gets all the mail. She gets flowers, chocolate, clothing. She gets everything. Pizza Hut coming 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. So I'm here to try to relocate her. So this is what's going on. She's been in her property for 40 years. My father owned a house next door. My father actually bought the home, which he finished paying for, the home where my mother's in for, for his mother. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a horrible neighborhood for her. Understood. Understood. So, Would you mind just giving us your name as well for the I'm record? I'm Kathy Small. Okay, and your mailing address. Uh, right now, and I'm with my mother, 1037 West 38th Street, North of, North of Virginia. I have an address, 7337 Drexel Road in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Great. Thank okay? you. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, well, um, Mr. Gordon, yes, sir. like some more, more opportunity now in rebuttal. Mm -hmm. You have five minutes. Okay. Again, the, 
from our perspective at this point, we'd just like to have this thing laid over for at least 30 days so that we've got an opportunity to meet with the developers, meet with the university, just, you know, so that we can absorb what, what will be built on that site and then come back and either be yay or nay at that point. But we think that, it, that a project of this size and density on this site uh, <coughs> deserves a good look from the, from the neighbors and the neighborhoods that are affected by it. Are you aware of the outreach that's happened with this project up until now? I, I understand they had a Civic League meeting at Lambert's Point back in November or something like that, but I've not heard of any meetings since then. All right, thank you. Um, comments, okay, commissioners, questions? I'd like to hear from the city. What, what is the outreach that the city's done so far in this program? So the applicant did have a community meeting at the time. There was no Civic League, so he did do a community meeting uh, on November 9th, and that information is attached to your staff report. Okay. I have a question. Uh, this uh, coming project is part of the uh, expansion of uh, the university housing project as a whole. What what does what what is the uh, difference in this project versus what else is going on around? The purpose of because there's a lot of it's this university. There's a lot of university. Uh, housing going on a dorm yeah, and this is going to be multifamily so what are we looking at essentially there are, we don't have any other multifamily going up in this area that yeah. we are aware of right now yeah. we do have a lot of uh, more in the Lambert's Point area there is a lot of um, right. homes being built that are probably being used by students but not multifamily per se. I, I I know the area, but uh, and and if we've had a, a, a we've gone over there with a field trip. I haven't been on that field trip. What I'm trying to understand is what is surrounding this smalls, and is this a continued expansion of the kind of building and structure that the university has been doing in that area. So this isn't being done by the university. This is market housing, so it's separate. Okay. Um, and a, as they pointed out, there is a. Uh, uh, the uh, apartments to the north that are being used by uh, mm -hmm. uh, students. Mm -hmm. um, again, not run by the university, but mm -hmm. it, it is being used by students. Um, and right now, this property is industrial, as is the property to the mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the uh, south of it as well. Mm -hmm. So really, we're we're converting what is industrial now into residential. Okay, so because uh, there are a, a couple of kinds of things that are going on, this is, makes you help. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> And the list of notifications that we have in our packet that was sent out in November that included uh, Miss Small and uh, the next on 39th. This, the list that Mr. Flanagan sent out, packet page 40. Right, as well as the OGU <coughs> yes. Foundation. Well, Mr. Chair, I just, I'd like to make a quick statement if I can. I, you know, I'm going to. A vote to let this proceed without a continuance uh, since everyone was notified. It does seem that Mr. Flanagan does have a little bit of work to do over the next month before it gets to City Council. So I hope you use that time. If this passes our our, uh, our planning commission, I hope you use that time to uh, get, get with the neighbors and work out some of these little issues uh, before it gets to City Council because you still do have a month there to go. Um. Any other comments from commissioners? Any questions? Ready for Susan, you're gonna are you gonna read the vote yep. this particular vote? The motion is to recommend approval of the street closure of a portion of Schumadine uh, from thirty seventh to thirty eighth street. <laughs> Votes been cast. Any changes? Uh, Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, by a six to zero vote, the commission has voted to recommend approval of the request. Thank you. We'll make that recommendation to council. Um, next item. The next item on your agenda uh, is another request. Uh, the second uh, part of this application is a request by James Flanagan for a change of zoning uh, on 
uh, from IL Industrial Light to MFAC Multifamily Apartment Complex at 1045, 1063, 1065, and south side of 38th Street. Uh, the purpose of this request is to allow the development of a multifamily apartment community with 150 units. Again. So again, this uh, is kind of a, in conjunction with the street closure that you just heard. Again, the property is located um, uh, between 37th and 38th Street, just east of Hampton Boulevard. Um, it is the site of the old uh, Heinz Ice Cream Building, if that helps you place it. I know you've all been out in the field, but just as a reminder. Um, and it is currently being used for offices, automobile repair, and a trucking terminal. Um, the applicant is proposing a 150-unit apartment complex. Uh, as I mentioned, the site is currently zoned uh, industrial, light industrial. So to accommodate the construction of the apartment buildings, okay, we did the street closure, a couple other things are required. Uh, a rezoning to MFAC, multifamily apartment complex, as well as uh, a conditional use permit to allow more than 24 units. Uh, as we do in our multifamily districts, when there are over 24 units, we also require the conditional use permit. Um, because the applicant is requesting or requested the street closure, approval of the design review uh, was required through the Architectural Review Guard and the Planning Commission. Um, the ARB did review these plans and approve them at their January 8th meeting. Um, this is a copy um, of the, uh, the first floor, um, but, uh, and we'll see in the elevations that I have later. Um, to give you a description of what the project is, it's a four-story building. Uh, it is residential on the outside, wrapped uh, by, um, so it's a parking garage, excuse me, wrapped by residential. Um, and the residents will park on the same floor their units are. So if you're on the third floor, you pull into the garage and you drive up to the third floor. Uh, they are proposing two elevators. Um, they are proposing handicap accessible units um, on the first floor. They're designated. Uh, there will be a fitness uh, facility, a meeting room on the first floor, uh, as well as a bike room. So if you've got bikes, you can keep them um, uh, in that indoor space. They will also have a bike rack located near the front door on 38th Street. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, they will have designated handicap spaces um, on uh, the, um, the first floor. Uh, two elevators, and those are essentially fairly close to those handicap accessible units. We have this diagram in our agenda packet. Oh, Load specific good. location for elevators. And uh, yeah, that was the right there. So if you, I hate to walk away. Guess what? Uh, bike room. That's the bike rack. This is the elevators, and all of the rooms with the A are the handicap accessible. This is a, a colored rendering. Uh, you see the amenities a little more clear. The brownish area is the amenities, and then the little portion off of that is the bike room. You've got a pool, um, and then the units. Uh, and then the next two are the elevations that were reviewed and approved through the ARB. Um, so staff is recommending that this application be approved. Again, this is something, uh, you're, you're taking uh, an industrial uh, piece of land, you're putting it into multifamily. It will actually act as a good buffer between what was there before the industrial, Hampton Boulevard, which is fairly a busy street, um, back into the more single family residential located um, to the east of this site. So for those reasons, staff uh, is recommending that the application um, be approved, and as we do, the conditions uh, tie it to um, the site plan. Um, and we also indicate that a final certificate of occupancy shall not be issued until the following amenities have been completed. Two elevators, a pool, a ground floor fitness uh, room, uh, and then sidewalks to be added along both 37th and 38th Street. Uh, and then one, I think that came up at the uh, meeting that they had with the community, uh, the hours of operation for construction of the project shall only take place between the hours of 7 o'clock a.m. Uh, until 5 o'clock p.m. So with those conditions, staff is recommending that the uh, rezoning um, uh, be approved. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Uh, excuse me, I do have a question. Susan, um, are these the same diagrams that the Architectural Review Board used to approve? Yes. Okay. Can you point out to me where the stairwells and the elevators. I, I saw 
you pointed to some areas that said elevator, but I didn't really see a marked or anything, so. I'm having a little difficulty understanding how the Architecture Review Board was able to approve this without us knowing exactly where the stairwells are. Um, you, you mentioned that the two A's are handicapped. Are, is that one A and two A are handicapped All accessible? of the A's. All of the apartments with A's are handicapped accessible. And, the, and this is all the first floor? Correct. But there's parking on all floors, but we don't have a plan that shows all floors. Correct. No, I don't in my PowerPoint. And we don't in our, in our don't, packets. They, may have, the they may have looked at that at, at the ARB, but it wasn't part of this application. The yeah. commissioners don't currently have them in their packets, I don't correct? think so, no. Okay. Yeah, um, and, and exactly how many parking spaces are there per, <coughs> per unit? I think the requirement is 1.6 in the zoning ordinance, and they do comply with that. Okay, they my, meet the requirement, but so they do have more than my, my reasoning for asking that question is that my packet is saying that there's one space per bedroom. So that's leading me to believe that each unit has one bedroom. Is that correct? It potentially makes us one to two. So rather than provide parking space by unit, we're actually uh, providing it by bedrooms. So we're, we're exceeding that requirement. Right. So in the staff report, um, again, our, our requirement is 1.6. So we require them to have 100 and, uh, or excuse me, 236 parking spaces, um, and they actually are providing 239. So they do comply with zoning, and they may have, and they have a little more actually. I, I think it's 239, but there's actually more than that. It's up to 236. Okay. okay. My 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 concern is accessibility, and without having a clear rendering of, of where stairwells are located and, and where... Maybe we could, maybe if the applicant could come up and... Yeah. Sure. Okay. That, that was provided uh, earlier, but... I should just say, these are the two elevators right here, and that is a stairwell, and that is a stairwell as well. Uh, can we go back to the rendering? So your stairwell is probably right here, and then it would be kitty corner. So I think it would be right in there. It would be on your two kitty corners. And the and the elevators, as he asked, it should be uh, in in the tallest uh, towers blocks. Where can you point out where that is on these renderings? The elevators are interior to the building, so I don't think you would see them in in the um, actual elevation. But okay. I can I can point them out again on the floor plan. Because your parking is interior, correct? So the parking is interior, and the building wraps the parking right. completely. So the only areas that you actually see parking deck is at the two entrances, both on Thirty Seventh and on Thirty Eighth Street. So you have both stairwells located on the front portion of the building on 38th or one on 37th and one on 38th? One on 37th, one on 38th. And both elevators are located in one central location on the front on 38th? Um, there, can you go back to the, to the plan? So they're located, I would say, kind of between 37th and 38th, but near the end. 37, what, what do you mean bet between 37th and 38th? So these are your two elevators right here. And so 38th Street, the, they're actually interior to the building portion. So, so an, an individual that occupies 2A 
as a handicap unit would come from 38th Street to the rear of 37th to, to access their unit? Uh, they, they could either come The majority of the A's are accessed actually from from the street, from the sidewalk. And and that's really my, my problem is that without a, a you know diagram that I can you know read and, and put my hands on, I, it's I, I I can't see where they're located. We've we've inquired about these elevators from day one, and we kind of keep getting pointed to around in this area or that area. I'm wondering if we have a if we have a diagram that shows us exactly where stairwells will be. Um, ingress, egress, and, and also elevators, and, and how they are you know, positioned with accessibility, handicap accessibility. So you have an interior corridor completely. Yeah. Along, and you, the elevators are, there is a demarcation for the elevators and the stairs are demarked right here as well. Okay. Uh, um, so, so again, my question, the an individual that's located to the rear of the building near 37th at 1A and 2A would be handicapped and they're coming from the front of the building sure. near the elevators at, at well this would be on the first floor right and so they would enter through a handicap accessible entrance here so there is an entrance there yes, there is an, yes it's shown right there I can't I'm sorry I, I don't well, it's have it's not that. in our it's not it's in not our in our package. package I've already said that yeah but, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if I may along the Nikita, uh, Mr. House, Hutchins, uh, Hutchins, uh, Hutch, Hutchins. Sorry. Hutchins. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, so sorry, so sorry. Um, he, yeah, what I what he's getting at because I'm asking, I'm thinking the same question. You're what you're intimating is that people can access elevators from both the street as a pedestrian and from the interior as uh, by car. They can come into to the complex by car, and they can come into the complex by foot from the street. So if they are, how is it accessible to people who need uh, a handicap accessibility? So it, it is accessible both from the garage and from street entrances, or I should say off sidewalk entrances. You have, you have this access as well, right here, which leads you down into the- Are, are there ramps there for it, somebody in a wheelchair to make it into that building? Yes, it will be ADA compliant. All right. Well, it's not just that, but we're under the presumption that someone that's handicapped is only going to utilize the first floor. But I may go to visit a neighbor on the fourth floor, and I've got to leave from the rear of, of, of closer to 37th and come back to the front near near the elevators, go back up, and then come back around again. And, you know, that again, that, that's been personally my question from day one was whether or not there would be elevators on either end of the building. And, and at, to this point, I haven't had a, a clear document to show uh, where that might be. But, you know, nevertheless, the stairwells are in this corner, and so they, they would lead up as well? They do. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Uh, here on this matter, uh, for some questions, uh, George Malamus. Next one. That's not this one. For hearing three. Are we on item three? Did I number it wrong? Yeah, we're. What's, what's the name of the item here? Item number three. That was 2A, not 3. Yeah, EDC. Hmm. Number 3 is EDC Ventures. Okay. Um, anybody else from, who signed up for item 2 wish to speak? Okay, any other questions, Commissioner? Uh, it's from staff uh, about uh, uh, Mr. Houchin's request. Uh, is it, uh, how, how, could staff have an input on this issue of, of the compli ADA compliance and our ability to see it clearly? I mean, they, this is a new building, so they will have to meet all building code. So if it requires it to be ADA compliant, it will be ADA compliant. Right.
Ready for the question then? Uh, the motion is to approve um, the uh, rezoning subject to the conditions uh, proffered in the uh, staff report. Well, there's no proffers. I, <coughs> this one I don't believe. Oh. Votes been cast. Any changes? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, by a uh, vote of six to zero, the Planning Commission has voted to recommend approval of the request. Thank you. We'll make that recommendation to Council. Uh, next item, uh, this is a, for clarification, this is agenda, regular agenda item four. Am I correct? Right. That's no, we're further no. than anything. So this is uh, the final portion of um, the last two items. Uh, it is a request by James Flanagan for a conditional use permit to allow more than 24 units at 1045, 1063, 1065, and the south side of 38th Street. Uh, the purpose of this request is to allow the development of a multifamily apartment community with 150 dwelling units. Okay, again, this is the same application we had, and as I mentioned before, um, in the uh, multifamily uh, AC district, apartment complex district, uh, anytime you want to do more than 24 units, you're required to get a conditional use permit. So this is following up on that uh, requirement. They are proposing 150 units, um, so they do need the conditional use permit to allow them to do more than 24. Same application we just discussed. Thank you. And staff is recommending approval. Uh, any questions, commissioners? I, I do have a question. Um, I have some concern with the documents that we're using to to um, approve this 150 unit development, and um, I, I'd like to know if it's within our purview um, to to tie a more precise drawing, a more precise rendering of the floor plan, and where ingress egress is is located, accessibility to um, elevators and whatnot, other than what we currently have in our packets. Staff, is that uh, something that we can we can tie to? I mean, I think that there are some documents that we've seen that we don't have access to in our uh, aren't in our agenda packet. Can we uh, get a more clear rendering of the questions that we've had and at least tie that to the to this uh, item going forward? Um, so I went down to try to find the uh, the file, and, and I do have the file. Um, and it really is no more clear than um, than than what Susan has put into the um, the PowerPoint. Um, and also, um, Susan and I were just talking. Just want to remind everybody that there was a conversation when this came from ARB, um, led by Mr. Houchins, that the elevators ought to be catty corny across the the garage as opposed to um, the the side by side approach that's here. So. Um, we do not have, I don't believe, things that will answer the question. Um, I, I'm sure that we can get them, but we don't have them today. I think it'd be helpful to have those and uh, make council aware that we're, you know, that our votes are contingent on uh, having that information available and available to, you know, all folks who've signed up here today. Council, I don't know if this is a question you can answer, but again, we've got concern from the community that it doesn't feel like they've had, you know, ample time to look at this thing. Um, I, I'd hate to have to um, continue this to a, to a, a, you know a, a longer date. But is there something that we can tie our vote to, um, you know, that would be more precise than what we've we've seen today that is part of this package? Uh, um. I, I, I don't know of a mechanism by which the um, by which the commission could condition the um, uh, application 
the completeness of the application as it goes to council. Um, I, I think the uh, I think the only options you have are to impose conditions that the or recommend that the city council impose conditions that the developer would have to follow during the execution of the project, um, or else hold off giving council your recommendation until you're comfortable that the documentation of what they propose to build um, uh, matches um, what is consistent with um, your opinion of, of, uh, of uh, good planning practices. So um, uh, I think you either have to send it forward with the best set of conditions that you can identify to make sure this is done correctly or not send it forward. But um, and, and offline, of course, staff can work to improve the quality of the information that's in the council packet, but I don't think you can um, control the completeness of the application through this, um, uh, through this uh, process. So, Mr. Houchins, uh, I mean, if, if there are specific concerns that you would like to see addressed, and if we can verbalize those and make those part of the, um, the conditions in the application, we can, I, I'm, I'm sure your fellow commissioners would be happy to. It sounds like if you have the well, catty corner elevator, is that, is that the main concern of yours, or is it more than that? Well, the main concern is accessibility, and I, and I don't think it, it's fair to anyone to put forth a recommendation without clearly being able to say precisely where some of these things that we're hoping is where they are are actually going to be. So, um, you know, again, I think it's a good project. I think it, it has the opportunity to be um, something great for residents in the community, but I don't think we have enough here to, to make a recommendation. And, and uh, you know, if anyone has anything that they'd like to chime in, then... I, I think Mr. Halchins is bringing up a very important point. I think we, I think we should think about the issue uh, and maybe even discuss it if ADH it, it, uh, compliance uh, can be perfunctory without necessarily design-wise providing uh, um, a building that truly allows people to live in it comfortably. I think that's the issue, really. Mm. Having uh, having th had this discussion with people who do this kind of thing and talk about this kind of thing because there still is a long way to go for people in the community who deal with accessibility. There still is a way to go about making buildings truly usable for people who need assistance in the building. So having clarity on that issue, as Mr. Houchin suggests, uh, would be a way of making sure that it's not just perfunctorily ADA, ADA, uh, ADA compliant, but that it actually does work in the way that it is intended to work by being compliant. Is, is that what you're getting at? I mean, that's well, I, what I, I see. I, I would hope that we're all there, but mm -hmm. um, it, it's been our practice that we weren't shooting for just the minimal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't think if there's if there's any no suggestions that we could you know that we can put forth from from this body then um, you know I'm prepared to make a motion um, that we continue this to a further date. What if we if we make our recommend or our, our thoughts our concerns our recommendations known to council at this time it's known to the applicant uh, it's known to the other parties allow everybody to work on a solution over the next month and you know, make it, at least make our thoughts known to council, and then if we haven't reached uh, an area that, that meets what you're describing, Mr. Houchins, then uh, I think council could also choose to continue it, uh, understanding that you know, council can continue this item if, we, if, we're, not, if we're not where we, we believe. I know that's not doing our full job and giving a complete recommendation to, to city council, but, um, you know, we at least have a chance of, of not putting this project offline um, now. It may still get pushed off at, at council if we can't come to a, an agreement, but uh, that, that may be a, a fair compromise. Uh, I would agree we, we did not get the information. I, I, I don't believe that, you know, in, in 
full that maybe we sh we should have up front. I don't know that I want to to penalize the applicant or the process over that. Well, <clears throat> and again, I don't I don't feel it's a penalty. We we made it clear uh, from day one that one at least I did that we wanted it would it would be much more accessible if there were elevators catacornered in the building. Um, and we were told that that's where elevators would be. Um, at this point, we don't have a clear document that shows us, shows us exactly where anything will be. Um, and so, again, I've asked staff, um, council, if there's, you know, if, if our recommendation um, is to have to hold any weight or, or to, for council, then that there's got to be some uh, rendering that shows what we're recommending. And, and what I'm being told is that we don't have one. So, um, again, my motion would be that this, this uh, would be continued until we've, we've got sufficient um, renderings to show what we're recommending. Mr. Flanagan, as the applicant, do you have anything to add on the request uh, to, to consider these elevators? Is this something that, that, from a design standpoint, you think can be accommodated? And then work with staff to, to come up with a you know mutually agreeable location for, for the elevators. We're not looking to to uh, to really delay the project. Um, it, it I, I would like to. It's not just the location of the elevators, but it's how uh, one can access the how it's situated within the building. From that point, how do you get from point A, point B, point C, uh, in terms of the uh, making the building uh, viable for people who need that? Uh, you, one can do a ramp and get somebody into the building and go up an elevator, but how is the what what happens flow wise? Um, I I think this is an important issue, not to penalize you or or anyone else, but as a We've got to think about these issues um, because this is an important issue, not just for this building, not just for the city, but it really is nationwide about how people with disabilities li are able to live in the, the, the uh, buildings that we built. Um, and uh, to that point, I think, that, uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Houchins has raised an important issue. Um, so, uh, I would my I would feel that put but that put that coming back with something um, so that it doesn't get lost in the process. Uh, I would ask: is it is it more viable in our process to do the compromise or to have people come back to make sure that the issue is being properly dealt with? So. Um... Mr. Chairman and, and members of the commission, um, having heard what you, you all are talking about, um, I, I, would, I, I would agree with Mr. Houchins. Um, a continuance at this point is, is the better um, solution. Um, it's very uncomfortable to put staff in the position of trying to divine what it is that you all really are looking for and you want, um, and to say that you know, you're going to pass it on, you're going to let staff figure it out. Well, I'm not sure that I can, not sure that we've done that bulk and mind meld between us so that I know exactly what it is that um, will, that, that y'all are concerned about. I mean, I know it in general, but the specifics. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I would recommend that you all go ahead and, and um, accept Mr. Houchin's motion for a continuance and, and vote on that. All right. We have a motion to uh, continue uh, this item. Any discussion on that? I'll second the motion. And to be clear for the record, the following vote is just to, um, uh, a yes would be to continue the item uh, to the next public hearing in March. Is that correct, Ms. Pollock? Yes, okay. uh, to March 28th, yes. I, I gotta okay. say bravo to her. She's got it right on the screen, too. Mm -hmm. On the screen. <laughs> well, I want to make sure the public knows. But you pass it, any changes? Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the uh, motion uh, is by a vote of five to one uh, to approve the continuance to the March 28th uh, Planning Commission agenda. Okay. 
Um, we'll move that to the March agenda. Um, you need to outline the vote. Uh, by, uh, uh oh, shoot. I can outline it was, that for you. It was, the vote was five to five one. Five to one, I didn't see with, who. With Mr. Murphy um, being the, uh, the, the one. Okay. All right. Um, next item. Okay. Uh, the next item on your agenda is EDC Ventures for a change of zoning from CN Neighborhood Commercial to MFNS Multifamily Neighborhood Scale at 8506 Chesapeake Boulevard. Uh, the purpose of this request is to allow for residential development. Okay, um, this is a request by EDC Ventures. Um, the site is located on the northeast corner of Fisherman's Road and Chesapeake Boulevard. Um, this area is developed with a mix of commercial, single family, multifamily, um, and institutional uses. The other street that comes in is Sunset, so it's a fairly complicated uh, intersection. Um, the applicant is proposing to develop the site with townhouses. So to accommodate this request, the applicant is proposing to rezone the property to MFNS, which is Multifamily Neighborhood Scale. Um, under the current zoning, which is CN, multifamily uh, and mixed-use buildings with, with at least 50% ground floor commercial would be permitted. Um, under the proposed zoning, the MFNS, that would allow <coughs> a, a few additional uses. It would allow not only the multifamily, uh, the multi, uh, excuse me, the mixed use with 50% ground floor commercial, but it would also allow uh, single family um, townhouses uh, on lots at least 20 uh, feet in width and uh, two family development. Um, however, as a result of actions taken by the General Assembly um, and reflected in our zoning ordinance, the applicant is not allowed to make a proffer. So normally uh, on a rezoning, it would be a conditional rezoning, and the applicant would proffer uses uh, as well as a site plan. Uh, the applicant knows what he wants to do. As I mentioned, it's townhouses. However, uh, because of the actions taken by the General Assembly, and we had to uh, mimic that in our zoning ordinance, uh, there, there is no site plan uh, to reflect uh, what the applicant is proposing as part of this application. So it would indeed be a straightforward uh, multifamily uh, neighborhood scale um, rezoning. Um, um, our recommendation, uh, as I mentioned, the area is developed with a wide range of uses, including uh, religious institutions, commercial uses, uses uh, apartments, and single family homes. Again, pro the applicant cannot proffer um, a site plan or the uses. But again, this area, um, the proposed unconditional rezoning of the site could allow single family development similar to what is located on the west side of Chesapeake Boulevard or a form of multifamily uh, townhouses, again, similar to what's located to the north. Um, a mixed use development uh, with commercial on the first floor uh, could be created. Again, that would be permitted under the current zoning. Um, so even though we cannot accept proffers, um, staff feels that the use uh, of the site with the um, zoning that is being requested um, is acceptable and, and would be appropriate at this location. So for those reasons, staff is recommending that this rezoning be approved. Any questions? Thank you. Just, uh, community support, uh, Civic League support? Um, yes, they do have, uh, I've gotten several emails from the Civic League indicating uh, support. Hi, Mr. Malinus. Now, uh, if you'd like to have a shot at this item, too, you're welcome. <laughs> Just give us your... Thanks for your time. Um, my name is George Malamos. Uh, I'm representing Malamco 2 Limited Liability Company, which owns the real estate, uh, the two lots just north of the site right there. Um, and first, want to say I love progress. I love new construction in Ocean View. Uh, I've, I live there and excited every time something's going on. I'm kind of surprised to be here because last week when I met with uh, with uh, Susan, um, I was under the understanding that this would not be recommended. It was incompatible due to the fact that the bank uh, lot that's behind there was not being included and being left commercial. So that was just my understanding. Now, I'm not a, a planning person. I don't know how the process works. I also sit here and I see plans and floor plans and site plans and elevations. So I'm kind of confused why some projects have that and other ones we can't see what their plan is. But I'll plead ignorance that I don't understand the process. But it would be nice to know what's going to happen with the property. So I'm not, you know, first not necessarily against it. But what I do want to say 
is that you know it's it's we don't have a lot of these pockets of commercial air neighborhood commercial areas in Norfolk. Um, there's a lot of uh, tenants we have and and other tenants in the area. It's not a very high high income area, and they utilize public transportation a lot, and they have to walk to stores. Uh, the closest Walmart is all the way down at Southern Shopping Center. I know people walk there. There used to be a, a Bilo here a long time ago. Maybe you know if, if you're familiar with the neighborhood. So I think that we have to be careful to give up uh, properties that have a uh, commercial potential. It would really be nice. I've talked to tenants there to have a, a neighborhood grocery store in the area or some other uh, business use. I'm not sure in this case, if if residential is allowed under the current zoning, why does it need to change? So my understanding is residential is allowed under the current zoning as it is. So I would say, could there be a solution with the current zoning that utilizes both business and residential and not give up such a big piece of real estate here? Um, and you also have to look at the whole area. I don't know who all the property owners are in the whole corner there, but if, if we start losing, you know, the capability to do this, then do we really need more apartments there, which I guess would be permitted if you approve the zoning. So, you know, I'm not against progress, but at the same time, I don't see a plan here. We don't know what they're going to do. I'm hearing you can't lock them in. I understood that the planning commission <coughs> was originally against this, and I see something about future land use in here that I wasn't told about and I don't know what that is. So I'm kind of concerned for our own property how we're seeing a plan materialize that says something about future use development. So I would just ask the commission consider this. We don't have a lot of these areas in Norfolk and I think we got to make the most of it and don't forget that everybody doesn't have a car or Uber everywhere. They just can't afford that and so neighborhood, community, Businesses, grocery stores, eateries are are very important. We don't just don't have that many in Norfolk. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, George or Stu, any comments on on that? More from a staff standpoint. Um, no. Again, uh, unfortunately. The um, other rezonings we saw, we did have a way to tie it to a site plan or a floor plan. But unfortunately, when it's purely a conditional, or excuse me, a, a residential rezoning, uh, we've we've had our hands tied. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you um, Mr. Mallow's comment was was a good one in that uh, it currently can have residential currently, uh, but we're changing it to the new zoning. And, and what's the reasoning behind changing to the new zoning from what it is today? Right, so again, the applicant would like to do townhouses, and townhouses is not one of the uses that is allowed under the current zoning. We can't tie it to that site plan, but that is what he would like to do. Uh, the the um, comment about um, how the site is going to impact the neighborhood, I think, is one that really needs to be carefully considered uh, because of what people need and that their circumstances uh, should not pre preclude them from being able to have uh, in the neighborhood the kind of neighborhood composition that allows people to shop and walk and uh, go to uh, the, the services that they need. It's something to be considered. You did say the Civic Leagues did, there was community support for the project. Correct. They did meet with the Civic League and we do have a lot of support for and I will say this, I live, I live out in Ocean View, and um, I, I share Mr. Malmose's thoughts that we need commercial out there badly. Um, I, I, I hate it, I have to drive to Ward's Corner to the grocery store right now. With that said, um, the market's just not there for commercial. Um, if this, this, spot, this, this lot's been empty for at least five, six, seven years right now, um, and I know the community's frustrated with it being empty the way it's been. Um, uh, the community supports residential going in here and obviously uh, potentially townhouse residential going in here. So, um, and as tough as it me for me to, to say I'd like to see a commercial go in there and keep it available for commercial, the property owner has, has some rights to it instead of probably just sitting there for five, seven, eight, nine years waiting for commercial to come that I'm just not sure it's ever going to come in that, in that area right now. It's just, and, and I, I see it all over Ocean View. I'm dying for, for a whole lot of things. Um, I, a dry cleaner we don't have. I can go down the list of, of you know, you know what we don't have uh, better than anyone else. However, 
in this circumstance, I think the community has spoken and, and, and they're comfortable with uh, residential going in here and, and I'm, I'm going to support that. Any other comments, Commissioner? I, I just have one other comment. I think obviously you raised some very valid points as well, the walkability um, and the potential uh, for, for what this commercial location could bear. Um, my question is, that I think is to staff, um, has the community had a chance to weigh in since they took the the bank lot out of the portion so they do know that there will yes. be yeah. one okay the applicant did follow up with the community after that and we that's why I said we had received several emails we had a follow-up one indicating that they still supported the request Very good. thank you I do want to answer mr. Malone's is one question you're seeing different roles different we're as aggravated as you are in some levels <laughs> that we can't see what's going to go here um, that's just state law uh, for residential properties we cannot uh, ask any questions or require them to do anything unfortunately I would love to be able to see a rendering and say, yeah, let's approve that. Um, I even asked the question of, of staff. Um, there are certain circumstances that we can do that, and I, I tried to push that uh, to make this a planned development. Unfortunately, it's a too small of an area to go do that. So th that's another area I wish I wish we could you know, push the button and say, no, we want to see it and, and, and get a feel for what it is. But unfortunately, in this circumstance, we can't do that either. So. Well, I do have some follow-up questions, if I could. So first question I have is why was I told the city the Planning Commission wasn't going to support this that it was incompatible I did not say that sir okay um, I got the impression that that was going to be that, that leaving the, this lot back here with just the bank which is commercial in this pocket let's say that changes to residential that this is problematic so I don't know how the Planning Commission sees having this piece of commercial sticking back in here into that neighborhood is that consistent with the plan if this is residential and you got a commercial spot here for the same reason tomorrow if I want to take our property and rezone it commercial after townhouses or possibly apartments are built here can I change that to commercial since we got this this little guy back there would that be compatible <coughs> Sir, we're interpreting all of these as rhetorical questions because we well, do not we do not engage in debate with with the members. Of the no, no, I'm not debating. <coughs> I guess uh, from a personal standpoint, we had commercial here. We invested in this area when it was commercial, and so the thought would be that it one day be nice if the commercial expanded. This could. So I, I guess I'll just point out to the planning commission: if this goes residential then we kind of lose the opportunity to have future expanded commercial development possibly don't know what the planning commission would do but obviously it becomes a concern to try to expand in that direction so that, that that's really all my point and I, should, I don't think the demographics of whether we support you know what kind of business is supported there should really play a function I understand we're we don't have a high income property there so we're we're limited as well with the investment in the property so just wanted to point out be nice to reserve those areas that we still have because once they're gone I don't think you can get them back so thank you for your time appreciate your comments any other comments commissioners the motion is to uh, recommend approval of the rezoning Votes are cast and changes. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, by a vote of five to one, uh, the commission has voted to recommend approval of the request. Uh, Mr. Houchins has voted no on the request. Thank you. We'll make that recommendation to council. Um, <coughs> next item. Okay. The next item is a request by Tidewater Communications LLC for a conditional use permit to construct a communication tower commercial at 600 East Indian River Road. The purpose of this request is to allow the replacement of a 545 foot tall AM FM radio tower. Hello commissioners. This proposal comes from Tidewater Communications for a conditional use permit to replace uh, an existing 545 foot tall radio communications tower located at 600 East Indian River Road. The site is located on the north side of East Indian, Indian River Road between Luxstone and the Riverside Magnolia Cemetery. 
The property is zoned IG for industrial general, which allows for communication towers with a conditional use permit. The original tower was constructed in 1973, and it will be replaced with a tower of similar design and height. The property is surrounded by mostly industrial uses with open space to the east and single family zoning districts to the south. This is an aerial of the site. Um, the applicant received approval from the wetland board in November for a guy wire that's anchored in the wetland on the north end of the site. And they are going through the site plan review process to ensure compliance with all standards in the zoning ordinance. The applicant is also applying for a 40 year easement with the city um, for a guy wire that's anchored on cemetery property. And that will go before city council on March 5th. If all approvals are received from the city, the construction process is expected to take four to six months. Um, and lastly, we did receive an email of support from this project from the Campus Stella Civic League back in November. Staff recommends approval of this conditional use permit. Any questions? There are, are um, guide wires currently with the existing tower? Yes, there's three guide wires. Um, and the new ones will shrink the footprint of those guide wires, not by a lot, but by a few feet. Thank you. Thank you. Here to uh, speak on this item uh, in favor, the applicant, uh, Christine Conrad. I'm the agent on behalf of the applicant, so happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, stand by. Uh, Mr. Eric Sherwood. Next one. Unidentified. Apologize. There's uh, our agenda doesn't line up with the elect new electronic agenda. Just one of the small. <laughs> Yeah, we're only out of four. All right, uh, I don't have any other uh, folks. Any comments? Commissioners? Get the vote. You're the only ones filling it in. I know. Okay, the I'm motion ahead. is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to conditions contained in the staff report. Opposed to cast any changes? Uh, Mr. Chair, by a vote of six to zero, the commission has voted to recommend approval of the request. Thank you. Make that recommendation to council. All right, now on to agenda item five. Okay. This is a request by the Colonial Heights Church of Christ for the following conditional use permits at 831 Mayfield Avenue and 833 Marvin Avenue, A for a religious institution and B for a daycare center child. Um, yeah. So this request is coming from the Colonial Heights Church of Christ to allow a religious institution to operate a daycare center, 831 Mayfield and 833 Marvin Avenue. The site's located in the Colonial Heights neighborhood in the area between Chesapeake Boulevard and Tidewater Drive. The property is zoned SF10, which allows for religious institutions and daycare centers with a conditional use permit. Uh, the use as a church was grandfathered on the site, but because they're proposing to uh, have a second use on the property, they're required to get a CUP for both of these uses. <laughs> Currently, the property is split into six separate parcels, so the applicant will be required to vacate all interior lot lines as part of this conditional use permit. This is a rendering of the site plan, where you can see the location of the proposed daycare, play area, and the planting strip that will delineate between the parking lot and the public right-of-way. The applicant met with the city's landscape architect to come up with a landscaping plan which has been included in your staff reports. Uh, the applicant will be given six months to complete the landscaping plan, as well as a recommended um, drive apron improvements and signage requirements for the parking lot. Um, here are photos of the proposed play area, which will be 12 feet by 58 feet. Per the zoning ordinance, daycare centers are required to have outdoor play areas um, located to the side or the rear of the property. Um, it's been located, at, in this case, on the side of the building because the site does not technically have a rear yard. Um, and because it abuts a residential dwelling, the play area will be required to be completely enclosed by a six-foot solid fence with an exterior landscape buffer that um, is capable of reaching six feet in height and at full maturity. Um, in addition to the play area, the children will be taken on supervised walks throughout the neighborhood 
and the Northside Park Playground is um, right around a quarter mile walk from the site. The applicant's proposing to have 30 children between the ages of two and a half and six years old. They'll have five to six staff members on site. Uh, they presented the Crossroads Civic League in November, uh, which voted unanimously in support of this proposal. Staff does recommend approval of this conditional use permit. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you. <coughs> All right, here actually for this item, uh, Mr. Sherwood. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Eric Sherwood, 8437 Benningfield Court, Norfolk 23503. Um, I'm here today to discuss the preschool and church that has existed in the, well, the church has existed in the Colonial Heights neighborhood for over 80 years, purchased back in the 1930s by um, citizens of this um, community. And we're here today, unfortunately, um, because of the conditional use permit process. Um, in this public hearing, I would like to make it known that I do not believe we had a legal obligation to do this process, as according to the City of Norfolk ordinance, churches are allowed to operate schools and daycare facilities as part of their religious uses. Um, I'd like to make it known and encourage the City Planning Commission and the City Department um, to, to be a little more considerate of the process, give people more options, um, we're here today um, with approval of the neighborhood, with approval of staff and things like that. But the unfortunate part is, is that the improvements that are being requested, we believe are unnecessary and create an undue financial burden on this project. We're attempting to add three classrooms to a church that's existed in harmony with its neighbors, without fences, without bushes, without issues for the parking lot for the last 80 years. I have several members of the community here today, including one direct neighbor that is affected by this that will speak on half of the project as well. We believe that when we come across a project in the city of Norfolk, that, that there shouldn't be such high barriers to the zoning ordinance when, when things are so small. Our entire construction budget is gonna be less than, uh, around $5,000 for materials. The project's gonna be built by all volunteers. No contractors are being hired, we're not changing a single thing to the exterior of the building. We'd like to paint it, but if we have to spend so much money on bushes and other things, then we're not gonna be able to do improvements inside the building and do things for the community that, that we've been doing for, for such a long time. And so uh, I would ask that the Planning Commission um, approve our application without the recommendations uh, listed in line A of our planning packet. Um, and in addition to that, um, A, subsection C, the play area with a fence and um, landscape buffer um, is something that's entirely new to me. I, I heard it in the, um, in the meeting at 1 o'clock um, in my discussions with planning staff and things as well. And then on my site plan, I only have a three-foot um, vinyl coated chain link fence. Uh, there simply isn't enough area for a fence and... and um, and bushes and if that is going to be part of the recommendation we're not going to be able to meet that and, that, and that's going to be an issue and so um, as we move forward in this process uh, I'd like to also say that the city planning staff ha has been accommodating and 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 things as well however uh, I believe that there's some inherent culture issues in the in the way that this process works and we want to be part of that solution. We've been part of the solution in Ocean View for a very long time. I, I'm employed and, and go to Ocean View Church and <coughs> Ocean View Christian Academy um, a little further in the city, and we're partnering with Colonial Heights to do this, to, to be able to, to be lights in the community, to be places where, where people can come and be fed, where they can educate their children, and where we can exercise our religious rights that this country was founded upon. I've personally, been a victim of religious persecution, real persecution, in a jail, well, not in a jail, in a police house in India for hours at a time. I've seen what it's like, and I believe we're bordering on this process on infringing our rights in the Constitution and under the federal law passed in 2000, known as RELUPA, where, where we're not allowed to create undue burdens upon land use. Based on my interpretation of the general use of a church in the city zoning ordinance, we don't believe that we were we should have been in this process to begin with. It's created delay upon delay. I can't get a building permit because of this process. 
and the church is frankly in danger of shutting, shutting down if we delay this process any further. So while I do not believe that we should be in this process, I do realize that it is what it is, and we have to do what you suggest and what city plan council will suggest as well. So I urge you to please pass this without, some, without these recommendations of planning staff, allow this project to go through with that, without these unnecessary improvements. And um, I'll be making the same argument to city council as well when we get there and ask them to do the same thing. Questions? Any questions? Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, also here in favor of the application, uh, Matt Scott. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Scott, 831 Mayfield Avenue, uh, Norfolk. I'm the pastor of the church, and uh, I've been with uh, Colonial Heights Church for almost five years. Been in the area here a little over 23 years. I worked with the church in Hampton for 19 uh, before coming here. And I just love the Colonial Heights Church of Christ. The people that I get to work with and the community that I get to work in, it's just such a blessing to me. One of the great things about this church, and, and I won't say the, the biggest reason, the biggest reason, of course, in ministry is you go where you believe God wants you to be. But one of the things that I saw in this church is a desire to impact their community. And you may notice, but there are churches dying all over the place, churches closing their doors. And my observation is that so many of those churches, it's simply because they've pulled within themselves. They've gotten so focused on little issues here and there with the church. Another problem for churches is um, that a lot of times expenses come up that are beyond what you could possibly budget for. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've put over $40,000 into our heating and air conditioning system. We had to make arrangements to do that, but that means the next time a big expense comes around, it's very difficult. The, uh, the idea of the daycare is first and foremost to serve our community. Now, a lot of that is we want the community to know that we're here and that we care, that we make a difference. And so we've stepped out in that direction. There's also a hope that, that uh, at the end of each month, there'll be a few dollars left over and that will help supplement or augment our, our offerings. But honestly, as long as we impact our community, the church is gonna grow. It's gonna do what it's supposed to do. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate what Eric had to say, but it's a difficult thing because you all have an important job. You know, there are certain things in the code, certain things uh, that the, the state code puts down and the city of Norfolk expects. But uh, if, if we can do this without undue delay or undue expenses beyond what's required, it will help us to be able to impact our community. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, here to speak for I, Mr. Gary Greenwald. <coughs> Um, Aaron uh, Dinini. Good afternoon to the commission. My name is Aaron Dinini. I live at 1518 Leeview Avenue uh, up in Willoughby, 23503. And uh, I'm here today to just kind of personalize this a little bit. Uh, I am the senior pastor at Ocean View Church. And um, back in 2016, uh, well, let me back up. And 15 years ago, came to the church, didn't know where my life was going. My life got turned around uh, because of the, the the place of worship where I where I found Jesus and believed. And from there, uh, I became the youth pastor for about eight years. Now I've been the senior pastor for six and a half years. And um, and along with this church came this beautiful school that was not so beautiful um, uh, not too long ago. Uh, but we've seen amazing growth and amazing impact in the community through being able to educate our students and uh, and take care of, um, of young children in preschool. And now we're all the way down to infant care um, at our location in Ocean View. And um, my kids have gone to uh, Ocean View Christian Academy and preschool since they were in preschool and are currently in the academy. I have five kids, uh, three of them currently in the school, two of them uh, too young for it so far. And, um, and I just want to reiterate the need for quality education and quality daycare in our city. People are going to Virginia Beach to take their kids to daycare. F folks that I've talked to, uh, people in the military that are, are coming in, live, live in Norfolk, want to go somewhere else outside 
outside of our city to take kids. Um, and we are right there. Both these churches are right close to the bases within proximity. And so um, there is a great need in our city. And, um, and so I'm here today to just, just reiterate what uh, Mr. Sherwood has said and just ask you to, uh, to vote accordingly to his requests. So thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, James Norton. <coughs> Good afternoon, my name is James Norton. I live at 846 Marvin Avenue. I am the neighbor that they spoke about earlier. I've been their neighbor for 49 years, my whole life. Uh, the church is more than just a church facility. It's something for the community. Since I was a kid and on, I've seen a lot of pastors come, a lot of leaders of the church come, but they've always come back with quality people. There's always been quality people. They're not just the church next door and you, if you're not part of it, you don't know them. Because these people right here are the ones you want to help. Because everybody else that we've heard today, they're doing it for financial reasons for their own pockets or their business. These people don't make any money out of this. This right here comes back to the church, back to the community, back to the kids that need this social interaction early in life so they don't go to school and act a fool. They also, uh, you know, but they're on a limited budget. They're an older church and they're reinventing themselves. And this, this uh, daycare is where they want to start. They've got the backing of another church that's already done it and has been so, so successful. You said you lived in Ocean View. I'm sure you've got to know about them, uh, the Ocean View Church off uh, Granby and government down there. Uh, they're great people. These these fences and, and borders and plants, it's not a blighted area. It's not a blighted area. They're all for upgrading, getting to the 2030, the beautification uh, program that Norfolk has. They need time. Give them an opportunity to, to do what they do, get started, and then if they want to revisit you know, these bushes and hedges, I'm sure they'll jump in. They're great people, and again, they're doing it for the best of the city. So I ask that you please you know, help them out. These are the ones you want to help out. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> um, Edward White? Good afternoon, my name is Ed Wyatt. I live at 858 Marvin Avenue, three doors down from the church. I'm also an elder at the church. I've been there six years. I see the impact that we have on the community. We operate, not only are we doing, wanting to do a, a daycare, we have a food pantry, we have a clothes closet, we outreach to the community. We bring, we have what we call Harvest Fest. We bring four and 500 kids in on Halloween. Keeps them off the street. We have games, we have hot dogs. All of this stuff we do out of our pocket because we love our community. We want the best for our community. That's all we're trying to do. Every dollar that we have to spend doing something else takes away from what we can do and impact our community. Thank you. Thanks, Dwight. Uh, Mr. Livingston? Okay. Uh, here also in favor but not wishing to uh, speak is uh, Vera Marie Livingston and Erlene Chester. Just here to support. Okay. Uh, and here, undecided, Miss Savannah. I'm fine. Thanks so much. Uh, questions, commissioners, comments? Pink said that the um, it, they're required to have a play area. Is the size of the play area stipulated? No. Nope. Just. The, there's no size requirement for the play area. It just has to, because, normally it's a four foot fence, but because it is next to a residential dwelling, that's what triggered this six foot um, solid fence. Right. So I see the need to, to separate, but um, a, a solid fence I think would make it feel like a tunnel. Right. Um, 
considering that the fence would be half the width of the area. I'd be comfortable saying that the, the fencing should be whatever minimum uh, state requirements should meet would be would be a fair statement um, here. All right, before, before we go, Mr. Chairman, if I might, and I don't know whether Mr. Melita or I should address Same this. Same answer, but, whoever gives it so you can. Yeah, I, before, before we drive too far down that road, um, the requirement for the fence and the landscaping and the height of that fence is is written straight into the zoning ordinance. It is not something that this commission or indeed city council can waive. It is an absolute zoning ordinance requirement as part of performance standards for um, child daycare facilities. Um, I don't know if there is a size requirement that's established by social services. Um, we don't establish one in the, the zoning ordinance. There may be some size requirements for outdoor play that, that is hardwired into um, the zoning ordinance or into the social service um, requirements. Um, but I'm not sure they, every daycare is required to have a social services approval right, either. Right. So, yeah. so I, I don't. So does the ordinance require a fence or does it require an eight foot fence? It requires a six foot solid fence supplemented by landscaping on the outside um, to that, that will grow to approximately six feet, at least six feet in height at maturity. If there's residential, if there's residential on the other side. immediately adjacent, which in this case there is. So then, with the perimeter landscaping, would that push the fence three feet closer to the uh, church? Not to not to my knowledge. Um, the so the six foot it just has to be six feet tall. The bear there's right, not the a the, the, the head tree uh, bushes right on the outside of the fence right. There, there are bushes, but they don't. There's not a, a width requirement for for those, um, for those bushes surrounding the play area. It, it doesn't even say it has to be on the property. So right. obviously, it can't go on the neighbor's property without the neighbor's permission. But if the neighbor were to give permission for the landscaping to be installed on his or her property, that would not contradict the requirement of the ordinance. Comments, commissioners. Other questions. Well, the only comment I would like to make is, um, I, I, you know, just for the sake of the commission and, and all interested parties, I think this is a, a great venture that the church is doing for the community and for the kids, and um, we we really are consistent with um, the ordinance requirements for for daycare centers. We get them, you know, they come to us, you know, frequent enough, and and most have the same concerns is that they'd like to do it as inexpensive as possible. Um, but unfortunately, we we have to follow what what the or, the ordinance says and and um, what what the regulation is state it brings from the state down. So that, that's the only thing I would would like to offer. And uh, can, no other can I address another comments? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, uh, the the problem with the landscaping is not that we oppose bushes or beautification or whatever. It's that because of the way that our lots are set up, for us to put in landscaping means taking out parking spaces. Now, back in the day, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, when this was a neighborhood church, 80% to 90% of the people probably walked to church. The people who drove to church probably had a, a, a big woody station wagon, and they probably piled five or six kids in the station wagon, plus the neighbor kids and whatever, I got some dogs and cats in there too. And they came and, and 40 or 50 parking spaces could accommodate a church of two to 300 people very easily. In our world today, it is not that way. My wife and I have three kids, they're all in their 30s right now. And when they were our kids were teenagers, there were times that five of us would take four cars to church. Or four of us might take three cars to church. And we had other families in the church in, in Hampton at that time that would do the same thing. And so for us to lose parking spaces for the sake of bushes when they've never been there, uh, that doesn't make sense to us. Again, it's not about the lack of beautification. It's, it's losing those parking spaces that makes an impact. I'd also suggest that if we lose parking spaces, as the church grows, more and more people would have to park on the streets. Now, I don't know about your neighbors, but our neighbors don't necessarily want us to have 
very many people parking on the streets. And so this is a way to create a solution before there's a problem by not making us take out the parking spaces. Thank, Thank you. you, Scott. Any further comments, commissioners? Questions? You know, certainly, um, you know, Mr. Scott, Mr. I think we're, we're done with, we've got all your comments for sure. I'd, Do you have any additional information to, to add? I, yeah, I have information about state law and, and those things that you were asking about. I didn't ask anything. So. You don't have any questions? I didn't ask anything. I, I wasn't yeah, 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 you know, I mean, I, I just want to, you know, let you know there's certainly no lack of, of compassion and understanding from, from this commission. I don't want, I want you all to understand that. Our purview and, and the, the, the rules that come down from state level that you know our attorney and director you know guide us on you know limit us often some things that we would like to do differently in certain situations um, but I, again I just I don't want you to think there's any lack of compassion or understanding about the, the needs there and then running these daycares now I mean a lot are a lot different than they were 20, 30 years ago. There's a lot more regulations around them for you, and there's regulations around us to ensure that there's safety and conformity across all these daycares. And they're, they're not all the same. And, um, uh, you know, so I'll leave it with that. I think we have the information that we have here, uh, you know, to, to move things forward. Uh, the motion is to approve the conditional use permits uh, subject to the conditions contained in the staff report. Votes have been cast. Any changes? Uh, Mr. Chair, by a vote of 6 to 0, the Commission has voted to recommend approval of the request. Thank you. We'll make that recommendation. Subject to, to the conditions contained in the staff report. Correct. We'll make that recommendation to council. Good luck. Uh, next item. Okay. The next item is a request by River Beach Brewing Company for the following conditional use permits at 3800 and 3808 Collie Avenue and 737 Michigan Avenue, A, production of craft beverages, and B, live entertainment. Good afternoon. This is a request from Reaper Beach Brewing Company for uh, two conditional use permits, one of which is to operate uh, an establishment that, for the production of craft beverages and the accessory use of live entertainment. The site is located on the corner of Collie Avenue and 38th Street within the Highland Park neighborhood. And the uh, site uh, includes not only the building here at the corner, but uh, the parking lot in the back along Michigan Avenue. Zoning on the property is CC, Community Commercial, which permits the uses with uh, the, the two conditional use permits. And here you see the proposed, uh, the operational uh, proposal as far as the hours of operation for on and off premises alcohol consumption, which would be noon until 10 p.m. seven days a week. And then the hours of live entertainment would start at 5 p.m. and end at 10 p.m. seven days a week. Capacity is as you see here with a total of 217 and the uh, entertainment options are, are uh, on the slide as well. So as part of this project, there are a number of site improvements. Um, one thing that staff uh, turns to with, with applications in this area of the city is the Central Hampton Boulevard area plan. Um, so you'll see along Collie Avenue, we do have uh, landscape planting strip to sort of uh, screen the parking uh, from the right of way. And that's along 38th Street, Collie Avenue, and Michigan Avenue with new street trees and bushes as approved by Parks and Recreation. Uh, one other improvement is a closure of an existing driveway along Collie Avenue, cl closest to the intersection with 38th Street. Um, that would be closed, and new sidewalk, curb gutter sidewalk, and landscaping will be placed there in its stead. And then that would also create the opportunity for additional on-street parking along Collie Avenue. The, as you can see here, the parking uh, remains on site in this configuration, as you see. Um, they will do a uh, new dumpster pad and enclosure as is required. 
Um, they will also have to screen the uh, adjacent residential districts. There is single family residential right uh, adjacent to the site. And as you can see, there's an existing fence there, opaque fence there uh, along a portion of that perimeter, but not the entire perimeter. So they would build a new six foot high opaque fence along the eastern property line to buffer, to appropriately buffer the new, uh, this use from the adjacent residential. And these are uh, a couple of the elevations. We have uh, four different elevations to show the four sides of the building. Um, the f these two, uh, the first one is at the front along uh, Collie Avenue, where it sh shows the windows uh, and, and the entrance. The one on the bottom is currently is on 38th Street. Uh, one of the improvements they're doing to the building is to unbrick the two of the windows along the 38th Street facade. Um, and uh, to kind of activate that street a little bit more for pedestrians uh, and just make it more inviting. It also, it also ties in well with um, the Central Hampton Boulevard area plan. Really calls actually identifies this, this intersection as a neighborhood gateway area and one of the nodes for concentrations of retail in order to build prominence and neighborhood character through critical mass and to reinforce the presence of existing restaurants as a better defined restaurant district. The final two elevations are the other side, um, the eastern side, as you see here on the, at the top, and then the outdoor seating area in the back is shown in the bottom. Staff does recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to the conditions in the staff report, which conclude all of those site improvements um, and the building improvements. Um, and I will say also the uh, Colonial Place Riverview Civic League did send in a letter of support as well as the Highland Park Civic League. And I did want to mention we did receive one uh, email of opposition from a nearby resident on Michigan Avenue um, who had some concerns with, with the music, uh, some of the alcohol uh, consumption effects that may have, um, and, uh, on par and also on the parking, potential impacts to the parking on the street there in the neighborhood, um, and the odor that could be produced by the production of craft beverages. Um, but I believe the applicant has, uh, is better equipped to answer some of those concerns. I believe he uh, may have some comments prepared to address that. And with that, I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, here to speak, uh, or the applicant is here. Um, I'm not sure if you'd like to speak. Uh, uh, Marty S.A. Yeah. Is he no, no available for questions? Okay. Uh, Mr. McDonald? Available for questions. Did you want to address any of those concerns yeah, that Mr. Actually, Whitley brought? I actually would like to. Just, just give uh, us your name and mailing address for the record, thanks. Sure. So, Justin McDonald, 1505 <laughs> Taylor Farm Road, Virginia Beach. Um, I just want you to address that email that did come in. Um, some of the points she made, um, uh, Ms. Montgomery, uh, she said uh, increase of parked vehicles on an already crowded street, referring to Michigan Avenue, I believe. Uh, noise of music from nearby people after 9 p.m. when some people are sleeping. Potential for increase of drunken disorderly patrons in our 700 Michigan Avenue block. Potential for vandalism by drunk patrons already have experienced it and don't want any more of that activity. Uh, offensive smell from the brewing process have noticed the smell outside of O'Connor's Brewing. At least they are in a predominantly business area. Uh, Collie Avenue North is being populated with too many bars and breweries next to a neighborhood with many families and older generation. Uh, and it says, please decline the permit for yet another brewing company in close proximity to plenty of other drinking establishments. Um, so I'm going to address those things one by one, uh, if I may. Um, so the, the first thing is increase of parked vehicles on our already crowded street. Um, it's exactly why we selected a building with adequate parking. Um, the lot is pretty large relative to the size of the building, and we've ensured the spaces meet the city's requirements. Um, in addition, we're going to be installing bike racks, and we want to encourage the area to be walkable and bikeable. Um, the second point was noise from music and nearby people after 9 p.m. when some people are sleeping. Uh, like most breweries, we're not a late-night operation. Uh, we're, we're not a bar. Um, the latest our tap room will be open at 10 p.m., and live music will end prior to this time, um, and all entertainment will be kept indoors, nothing outside. Uh, her third point is potential for increased drunk and disorderly patrons in our 700 Michigan Avenue block. Um, while we cannot control the behavior of private citizens, uh, we absolutely can discourage overconsumption and do. 
um, by identifying and not serving an intoxicated person, which any ABC licensee is required to do. Um, this is also part of why we limit our hours. You know, we're, we're not going to be open until 2 a.m. Um, we're open until 10 p.m. maximum. This, this mitigates a lot of those problems and kind of helps us avoid them starting to begin with in, in, in our operation. Um, so again, it's important to note that we're not a bar. We're a manufacturer um, who invites patrons in to uh, try the product that we make. Um, the fourth one was potential for vandalism by drunk patrons. I already have experienced it, and I don't want more of that activity. Um, this is essentially the same point as her number three. Um, it's our goal to operate a business that's friendly to our neighbors and works to mitigate these, these issues and prevent them before they happen. Um, the fifth one is offensive smell from the brewing process. Have noticed the smell inside of O'Connor's Brewing. At least they are in a predominantly business area. Um, as far as offensive smell goes, um, this is pretty subjective. Um, I, I think the brewing process smells like a bakery. Um, not everyone's going to agree with me, um, but again, that's, that's kind of a subjective <laughs> thing. Um, another thing to note is uh, a lot of the beer that's going to be um, sold in Norfolk will be produced at our primary Virginia Beach location. The brewery that we're going to be installing in Norfolk would be a, a small pilot system. So we're going to do kind of more test batches, more small batch things. Some of that beer will be made in Virginia Beach and just transferred, um, which is legal under ABC law. Um, the final and sixth one, Collie Avenue is being populated with too many bars and breweries next to a neighborhood with many families and older generation. Um, it, we feel that the addition of a another good, responsible business to North Collie is a good thing. Um, you know, providing jobs, uh, increasing property values, generating tax revenue, adding to local culture. Um, so we look forward to being good neighbors and stewards of North Collie. That's all I got. Sounds good. Thank you. Sure. I've got a quick question for you. Sure. Um, your hours of operation, seven days a week, are noon until 10 p.m.? Uh, so you, you, they, they are. We, we said noon to 10, 10 p.m., just kind of putting in there the maximum that sure. we would ever be open. And I'm that, wondering why you didn't do the same thing for the hours of entertainment. You have that from 5 p.m. until 10 p.m.? Uh, we we kind of just want to keep that as more limited thing. I don't want anybody to get the um, impression that we're a concert venue. Um, that's going to be something that we primarily do kind of, uh, you know, like a Friday or Saturday night thing. Um, we probably would never have it during the day. Um, okay, it's just the other ones do. It, and it, it just jumped out at me that if you're going to have a one-year anniversary party on the, a Saturday, you might want live entertainment before 5 o'clock. That's, that's that's a fair point. Um, however, it's in there. So if we kicked off music, we'd be kicking off at 5. <laughs> that, that's what you, you want to stick to. You don't. I, I don't know. Is it, is it too late to? Okay, then, then we probably will we'll try to work with staff to uh, to add that because that's a great point. Something that hadn't occurred to me. Don't even have to work so, with staff. We this, can, is it, this is it. This is it. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, well, I, I guess. I guess same as the hours that, that are on there. If if, if that's going to be something we can approve. Um, again, that's not something that we're looking to do all the time. But but again, to have that flexibility would be greatly beneficial. We would agree. Mm -hmm. So noon. So noon okay. until ten is yes, what you're saying. You need a motion to make that. We'll include that in the motion. Thank you. If, if, if we notice that everybody's heads yes. are going north south and nobody's going east west, we don't need a motion. We think it's okay. important to keep you on the same playing field as the other businesses. I appreciate that. Same that. thing in. I appreciate that. In north, don't have to come back through to go through the process again. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, here to uh, ask questions, perhaps, to Mr. Endicott. Uh, Joe Endicott, 728 38th Street. So I am on the other side of the fence. Um, I'm glad to have somebody coming in, number one. Um, actually, the thought of a brewery was a plus uh, because of the hours being not till 2 a.m., that's a good thing. Uh, there were just a couple of things that did have me concerned. One of them is the frequency and uh, level of the live entertainment there. We do have a lot of school age kids, you know, between my house and the brewery, there are elementary school age kids trying to sleep <laughs> directly behind our house. It's the same thing. Uh, I was glad to see in here that it's going to be limited to inside which uh, that was one of our big concerns. So that did answer a question, but it does just say avoid significant adverse noise. So I, I'm curious, is there a, a, an actual way of measuring what that is or is it I think it's loud and I don't? Um, at, at what point would uh, that concern be 
raised? I mean, how do, how do we gauge that? Hopefully neighbors would talk directly with the business owners if there were any concerns. Hopefully talk ahead of time about what expectations are. And, um, and most of the time those issues can be, can be addressed within the, your, your community. Um, you know, I, beyond that, uh, it, so th that's correct. And there is a, 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 a Norfolk does have a noise ordinance that has uh, decibel standards mm -hmm. based on whether you're in a residential area or a commercial area. And so there is a measurable way to determine whether or not the person um, creating the noise uh, might be um, in violation of the uh, criminal provisions of the code. Sure. Um, but frankly, um, the um, the complaints of neighbors and the desire to maintain peace and enjoyment among neighbors is probably a, a more significant measure of whether what's going on is acceptable or not rather than the noise meter. So the noise meter is sort of the uh, the, the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, uh, the chairman's correct in that um, the you would you, you would need to approach the business to make them aware of what's appropriate for your, your street. And, and don't get me wrong, I live on 38th. I understand noise. I mean, that's, it's not a thing. It's college kids, it's, you know. But uh, it, it is, you know, a bit of the, uh, how, how much over time. And we'll, we'll work with that, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be coming in over there. So, well, like I said. If I can put you at ease a little bit, we deal with this a lot downtown. Mm -hmm. And if you call the police non-emergency number, they'll go and they'll talk to the business, and the businesses generally cooperate in turning down the music. Um, because <coughs> they're in the business of making and selling beer, and they don't want to put that at oh, risk. Sure. Yeah, and, and that's so you that's don't have good. to confront the business directly yourself. Well, I don't. I don't mind talking to them. I mean, right. it seems like a nice. Yeah, yeah, we'll be there opening day, so we're gonna be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, now the other thing on uh, that just it was just kind of a uh, little bit off on the plat. It shows existing fencing that's there, and it shows, uh, yeah. And it looks like you guys are talking about putting in a six-foot opaque here, which is nice uh, there. Uh, this is not an existing eight-foot solid wood fence. Right now it's a barbed wire-topped chain link from the post office. Um, I believe this uh, fence on this side is wood to here uh, because this neighbor installed it, okay? So it comes to here. This part that wraps around is all just open chain link. Would that be part of your plan? To it's our understanding that we must make it all solid. Okay. And, and so, so that, that part so has that to be replaced. Your, your yep. Right on. Do we need to have that included? Uh, I, I would recommend that Susan make clear in the amended motion um, that all portions of the property abutting the residential parcels to the east be improved um, with an eight foot uh, solid fence uh, wherever one does not already exist. Thank Appreciate you. it. Any other comments, questions? Uh, I would like to say that I had wondered what was going to happen with that building, and I'd like to commend uh, uh, the, the brewery that's making the proposal for what you're doing with the building, and especially in terms of the fenestration, because it's not a bad little building, and uh, what you're doing, I think, is going to uh, bring it back to looking good on the street. Comments? Sorry, ready. Okay, so the motion is to approve the conditional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the staff report with the following changes: that the hours of oper op uh, the hours of operation for the entertainment be changed to twelve o'clock noon until ten o'clock p.m. seven days a week, and all portions of the property abutting residential to the east be improved with a solid eight foot fence. Murphy. Votes been cast. Any changes? OK. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, by a six to zero vote, uh, the commission has voted to recommend approval of the request. Thank you. Make that recommendation to council. Good luck. Okay, the next item, the Bold Mariner Brewing Company for the following conditional use permits at 1901 East Ocean View Avenue and 9638 Cape View Avenue, A, production of craft beverages, and B, live entertainment. <coughs> Good afternoon. This is a request from Bold Mariner Brewing Company um, for two conditional use permits, the production of craft beverages and the live entertainment accessory use. And the site is located at the corner of East Ocean View and Cape View Avenue within the Cottage Line neighborhood. And it's the existing, uh, it's, it's the current uh, building was formerly used as a bank. <coughs> Zoning on the property is CC again, a community commercial allowing these uses with conditional use permits. And the site was previously uh, owned by the city, and uh, so therefore it went through the city's design review process, uh, obtaining approval from the Architectural Review Board and the Planning Commission for the um, two things that you'll see on the site plan later, but essentially uh, an enclosure of the rear teller, bank teller lane um, for, uh, to, to, to uh, enclose what they would plan to put, uh, where they would put their brewing operations. And then the an exterior stairway on the eastern side of the, of the building. Here you'll see their hours of operation, uh, capacity, and entertainment options. Um, as is typical of, of uh, breweries, uh, that their hours are noon to 11 p.m., seven days a week. Uh, and then their entertainment would end one hour before that, seven days a week at 10 p.m. With a, the uh, building itself is 300 uh, total capacity, um, and the outdoor seating is quite uh, substantial, so that's why you see the, the 100 seats there. And the entertainment options, you see uh, live band karaoke, comedian poetry reading, trivia night, and a disc jockey with a dance floor. So this is the site plan I mentioned, and the uh, couple of the uh, improvements to the site uh, through this process. Uh, again, I mentioned the enclosure or the infill of the uh, that rear portion, uh, the new covered stairway on the eastern side of the building, and they will, uh, as, as required by the transportation staff and the Department of Public Works, they are closing the driveway closest on East Ocean View Avenue, closest to the intersection, and replacing it with sidewalk, curb gutter sidewalk and landscaping. And there, are, there's an existing, uh, there's quite a substantial amount of existing landscaping and foliage on the site, uh, a lot of which you'll see along the perimeter of the site, uh, the eastern perimeter of the site uh, abutting the residential zoning district. So much like the last one, they have to buffer the, this use from the adjacent residential. And as you can see there, they have that opaque fence running along the perimeter of the, uh, of, of the site. These are the elevations, uh, again, the showing that infill of the rear portion of the building and the exterior stairway there. Again, the other two sides, rear and then the western side. And staff does recommend approval of these two conditional use permits subject to the conditions contained in the staff report, uh, which include those site improvements I mentioned. Uh, also, I will mention the uh, Cottage Line specifically did send in a letter of support for this proposal. You know, I'll stand by for questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, no opposition uh, to this application here on behalf of the application is the applicant, Michael Stacks, uh, Gary Greenwald here as well, and uh, Justin Spruill. No opposition. Do you all have anything you'd like to add? I'm on the next side. I'm on the next side. It's, it's okay. Oh, yeah, you are. I don't know what's happening over here. New, the computer system's just fine. It's just Mr. Hale. I'm concerned about it. Um, all right. Any comments, commissioners? Sorry, I had a quick question. I didn't even know I was going to ask a question, but I'm curious. That there was an LED sign. We have to actually have you signed up to speak oh, on that. We can speak. On behalf. Thank you. Go ahead and talk. I can, I can address that really Great. quickly, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe, uh, if you could go back to the site plan, 
he's referring to the uh, existing sign uh, at the corner of um, Cape View and East Ocean View Avenue. And yeah, there is a condition in the, uh, as part of the site improvements. The, the applicant does um, f uh, intend at this, at this point to keep that sign. However, that will require modification of the sign to uh, fully conform with the zoning ordinance. And part of that is that it, it can't have the LED, LED portion, the move, movable sign um, as it did with, when it was a bank. So they, they, they couldn't. You're uh, saying that sign's coming down? No, they, they yeah. just would modify. If there was anything like height or width or uh, distance from the sign to the property line, if anything like that was was not uh, in keeping or in conformance with the zoning requirements, they'd have to modify it to, to be conforming. And then the LED portion that he mentioned is is not allowed. So that would be removed. That part of the sign would be removed. Great. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your... Yeah. Great. Sorry about the parliamentary procedure, but uh, we got, I hope we got your... Concern, answer, and address. Uh, any comments, questions? Good for the vote. Okay, the motion is to approve the condition use permits subject to the conditions contained in the staff report. So it's been cast, changes. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, by a six to zero vote. The commission has voted to recommend approval of the request. Thank you. Good luck. We'll make that recommendation to council. Uh, new business item one. Okay. Uh, this is a request for a development certificate. All the uh, modifications of a previously approved 21st Street PCO pedestrian commercial overlay development certificate to allow renovations to the facade at 730 West 21st Street. Hello again. Uh, so as you just heard, this is a request for a development certificate uh, for 730 West 21st Street. Certificate would allow building renovations and changes to the facade as part of a conversion of the space to an Aldi grocery store. The site's located within the 21st Street pedestrian commercial overlay, uh, which requires a development certificate for any changes within the zoning district. So as part of this process, the development certificate had to go uh, before ARB uh, which happened earlier this week, and they recommended approval by a 7 0 vote. Uh, this is the site plan for the proposed Aldi. The grocery store will be 23,087 square feet, was most recently occupied by a Farm Fresh grocery store. Uh, in order to meet the parking location and access requirements of the PCO, <laughs> the applicant will construct a three foot hedge between the parking lot, 21st Street. These are the proposed elevations along 21st Street as well as the area facing the parking lot. Uh, the drawing on the top is along 21st and the drawing on the bottom is the area that's facing the parking court. Uh, the applicant's proposing two different wall signs. The one facing 21st Street is six feet by seven feet and the sign facing the parking lot is 10 feet by 12 feet. Uh, and both of these meet district requirements for sign size. Oop. Sorry, <laughs> a letter of support from the Bagant Business Association re was received on February 22nd, um, and the applicant is not requesting any waivers as part of this development certificate, uh, and staff does recommend approval of this as well. Any questions? Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, here on behalf of this item, uh, uh, Justin Spruill and uh, Robin Thomas. Anything additional to add, Robin? Sure, thank you. Questions, commissioners? Well, ready? Okay, the motion is to uh, approve the development certificate. Vote to cast, any changes? Okay, Mr. Chair, by vote of six to zero, the commission has voted to recommend approval of the development certificate. Thank you. Yep. Thank you guys for that. <coughs> Next new business item number two. Um, so this item uh, is a request to initiate a zoning text amendment to parts of the demolition process and the historic and cultural conservation portion of the zoning ordinance. Um, 
So uh, again, this is an initiation. We don't have the text here for you today. Um, the Architectural Review Board is working on that text, and as they work their way through it, we will bring it um, as a formal staff report and information to you. Um, but today's uh, request is for you all to just initiate, uh, allowing us to move forward with the ARB to create the language. Mr. Chairman, uh, just to, to amplify a little bit, the purpose of this is to improve the communication process that occurs around um, the, the potential demolition of buildings within historic districts. And it's related to, to several um, demolitions that we've re had to deal with recently um, that you all are very familiar with. So um, this is a, a way to try to get um, more information out to the public um, in, in an earlier and, and more timely manner. Any comments? Go for it. Okay. Uh, the uh, motion is to uh, approve the initiation uh, of the uh, text amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, by a vote of six to zero, the commission has voted uh, to initiate the text amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other new business items? One more add-on. <laughs> uh, we have the uh, City Planning Commission annual report. All right, thank you, members of the commission. It's my fault. I get you get to stay here a little bit longer. <laughs> I'll be quick. So it's that time of year again. Every year this, uh, this meeting we uh, ask you to approve the annual report of your processes from the prior year. So it's time now to review the 2018 annual report for the City Planning Commission. So we've been doing this since 2011. Uh, the report does summarize all of your activity for the year as well as the Architectural Review Board activity, including those ARB items that you don't see. Um, so some certain items do go through directly from ARB and get approved then, but we do uh, include those as well. So, uh, but primarily it's about the activity of the Planning Commission during the year. So in summary, in 2018, the Commission met 21 times, held, held 12 public hearings, and um, saw, acted on 167 items. Additionally, ARB acted on 108 <laughs> items. Um, a little less than half of which were, were seen by Planning Commission along the way. It was a fairly typical year, you see by the, the graph here, um, almost exactly on average in both numbers. And so you see that here. The 10-year the average is, is 166 and a half items, and you all saw 167, so you're overachievers in 2018. Uh, and, and you all do have a 96% approval rating um, for the year, and it, uh, just slightly over the 10-year average. What that shows, as we always say, and we always hear from you all, is the, is the good work of our staff um, to make sure that the items that get to you are the items that are, are, are complete and well, um, well evaluated. Um, so you don't, have, you don't have to deny as many as you otherwise would. So again, 2018, fairly average, with the cons fairly consistent with the 10-year the period. As always, the bulk of the items that you see are conditional use permits. Up to March, they were called special exceptions, but conditional use permits are the bulk of what you see. 46% um, of them are related, of those conditional use permits are related to alcohol and entertainment. That's a, a decline from prior years. You're down quite a bit on that. We think that's a result of the new zoning ordinance. One of the, one of the um, some evidence that some of the elements that we put in the new zoning ordinance to streamline processes are showing um, showing it bearing fruit going forward. So hopefully we'll see that continue. City Council um, oftentimes, very often, agrees with your recommendations. You're at a 96% at a concurrence rate, which is um, fairly typical with where we always are. So uh, I think that shows that City Council does um, appreciate and respect the work that, that you as a commission and, and our staff put into these applications. Um, there were two items that council disagreed with um, Planning Commission on this um, this past year, and one item was withdrawn prior um, 
prior to council that would have that um, was recommended now by planning commission so that one just to be aware of um, and again the the concurrence rate is dead on with um, the trend ARB had a, a fairly typical year um, it was quite different from 2017 um, again 96% of the items to ARB were approved um, that came through that group uh, so again showing that I think we're, we're on track with where we are um, getting the items to the the board that need to be gotten to of note the ARB supported the creation of one new historic overlay district and four historic landmarks so we are now up to 14 up to 13 landmarks just in the few years that since we've been doing that and um, adding another historic district is pretty significant as well so um, just wanted to highlight that aspect of the work um, that both ARB and Planning Commission did this year on historic preservation one of the other elements we always highlight in the annual report is our building permit, um, our building permit numbers. Again, just to show the results, the end results of, of where, um, where our work takes us. The easiest way to look at that is, is in um, residential dwelling units. And in 2018, planning commission saw, or um, sorry, the city saw 735 new dwelling units permitted, which is um, pretty much right on average from the the last 10 years so again it was a 2018 was a very third very typical year through and through um, and similarly with the um, the number of units demolished so you see that we netted as a city 526 dwelling units in 2018 and that's a an, again a fairly typical number um, give you a sense of, of the number of residences we're adding to the city on an annual basis you all don't just do um, don't just handle the items that come to you for approval. You also uh, work with our staff and um, uh, and others to consider other items. Um, obviously, the big thing of the last couple of years for us has been the new zoning ordinance that was adopted in 2017, but it went live in 2018. It's been a big part of our workload um, over the last year. And you see here there have been several other projects that we've been we've been working on. You have. Um, you as a commission have been a big part of these projects and will continue to be since several of them are not yet complete. <coughs> and that leads us to uh, our 2019 work program. This is just part of, this is just a sample. These are just the first items on the list. Uh, it's actually about a two page list of items. Um, so you see here, we're still, um, several of the projects that, that you've been working on the last several years with us are still in process. And uh, we've got quite a bit more um, on the agenda in the coming year and um, that's all that's all I have so just to to let you all know the um, the inner report as always we ask that the, the Commission recommend um, recommend it be approved adopted um, and sent to um, sorry sent to City Council so our intention would be um, should this report meet your um, meet your approval today that it would be um, sent to, to City Council tomorrow. And um, I believe we're intending a presentation on, or at least a, a summary of this um, in April at, at City Council potentially. So um, it's something that we always hear from Council about how important and how much they appreciate getting this, this report from them, from the Commission every year. And so with that, I'll answer any questions thank you Jeremy uh, certainly on behalf of Chairman Fraley and my fellow commissioners thanks to you and your staff for all the hard work you've done to uh, make that a very successful year um, made some great changes that we see in the fruits of your labor uh, certainly appreciate all your work commissioners anything else to add okay the uh, motion would be to uh, adopt the um, Planning Commission annual report. Uh, Mr. Chair, by vote of six to zero, uh, the Commission has recommended uh, adoption of the uh, annual report. Okay. Thank you. Any other new business? No. Anything from you, Mr. Maliva? No, sir. All right. Director, anything? Mr. Chairman, no thank you. Thank you. We're uh, staying adjourned. Thanks for your patience with the new system. I think it was a success. Okay, I'm not touching it. I'm just leaving it. <laughs>